Ciao, I am Renato Flores, the publisher of all the scholarly and entertaining books on Rudolf Valentino and Natasha Rambova by Evelyn Zomaya. I'm here today with Evelyn to hear more about this fascinating work. Ciao, Evelyn. Ciao, Renato. Today I will be reading an English transcript of an interview given by Rudolf Valentino's only brother Alberto in 1977. He was then interviewed in Italian by the Italian-American newspaper L'Italo Americano. This rare document is filed in the archive of Michael Morris, the author of Beyond Valentino and Madame Valentino, and was a source for his work and My Affairs Valentino. Now this printout was given to Michael Morris by Leslie Flint. As a translation of, as I said, the interview with Alberto Valentino published originally in Italian in L'Italo Americana on October 1st, 1977. In addition to some remarkable memories Alberto shares about Rudolfo, he also makes the stunning revelation that his brother planned to legally adopt and assume full custody of Jean. Alberto also reveals he knew Rudolf named Jean his sole heir, when this was in direct opposition to what he had been declaring for decades. Now, I've mentioned in previous podcast episodes the documented totals of cash advances, jewelry, cars, etc., which Alberto received from his brother's estate. And this is a great deal of money and merchandise, as outlined in Affairs Valentino. Yet we see here in 1977, Alberto again repeating the falsehood, saying he never received anything but pennies, and a few sentimental items from his brother's estate. He also implies the estate executor George Ullman held up the legal works and was the cause of that disaster. Nothing, and I repeat, nothing could be further from Alberto and Ullman's truth. Ullman was 100% exonerated on all of Alberto's charges and praised by the court. And this is verified in the court documents I recovered, uh, which I have shared and which are publicly archived. I'm sure in 1977, Alberto felt safe to make false claims about Allman's executorship because any documentation revealing the facts about that had been stolen from the Los Angeles County Hall of Records. Now, you know, Renato, it's very difficult for me not to correct some of the statements Alberto makes in this interview, but for today, I'm going to leave it as he spoke it. So one must listen to this interview with a critical and informed mind. Exactly, Renato, but I feel this is an important historical piece, and for this reason I share it today. I do not think this is all of the two-part interview, by the way, but it's the portion still filed in Michael Morris's archive. I will post the scans of this transcript on my blog at evelynzumaya.blogspot.com. So, without further ado, I quote the article. Part 1, translation from L'Italo Americano, October 1, 1977. Interview with the brother of the celebrated actor. With The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, Valentino Conquers Celebrity by Argentina Brunetti. Alberto has very few material mementos of Rudolph. Some jewelry, which he keeps in a safe deposit box at the bank. A bust the work of a sculptor friend, which the artist had to finish after Rudolfo's death without his model, and then a large family photograph with a dedication and a few pictures in which the two children were snapped. Alberto was three years older than his brother. He was asked how he happened to be in Paris when he received the terrible news. Rudolfo had made me his representative, he said. I was to open an office under the wing of the United States government to safeguard his interests and the contracts he had made with the great producer Joe Schenck of United Artists. Rudolfo was to be co-producer of the forthcoming films, for which he was to receive a fine percentage of the profits, as well as a fabulous salary. Naturally, I participated in those arrangements. However, fate decreed otherwise, as even before the first film was made, when the contract was to become effective, the cruel and unexpected hand of death removed Rodolfo from the life he so loved. I had disposed of my house in Rome, of everything for the move to Paris. Valentino spoke with a voice somewhat hoarse with emotion of those sad memories. Were you very close as children, you and Rodolfo? Actually, no, not as children. 
I was three years older than he, and moreover, of a different type, calm, studious, and serious. Rudolfo had the devil in his makeup. Among his friends, he was the ringleader, daring to do anything, especially when it concerned pretty girls. One time on a bet, he stretched a rope between two adjoining balconies, 15 feet above the ground, and walked this tightrope from one balcony to another. He was a natural-born acrobat and afraid of nothing. My mother nearly fainted when she saw him tottering on the tightrope, arms outstretched. He, undaunted and smiling, flushed with triumph, descended from the balcony and, taking the arms of two pretty girls who'd stood underneath watching, bore them off in triumph. He was then 12 years old. At 17, I can't tell you how many girls flirted with him and he, in turn, with them. Some of the studio people, film men, etc., came to Castellaneta, in our country, to inquire how Rudolfo acted as a boy whether he let himself go among the boys, but I assured them he was always gallant with the girls. Some of them wished to charge him with homosexuality because he dared to wear a platinum slave bracelet with his initials on his wrist in America in the company of rough and coarse people around the studios and because he dressed in a refined and princely manner. I remember that at 16 he fell in love with a vaudeville artist, very famous, and 10 years older than he, and she was pleased with his attentions. Rudolfo was very proud of this conquest, indeed. Then at 17, he ran away from home and went to Paris to see a girl he was desperately in love with. However, it appeared that when he saw her again, he changed his mind because after a few days, he returned to Castellaneta, determined now to go to America. He dreamed of America. Mother wanted to know nothing of this, and our little sister Maria, three years younger than Rodolfo, who adored him, wept bitterly every time he mentioned America. To me, Rodolfo was a bit batsy. I thought that perhaps America would calm him down a bit and instill a certain sense of responsibility in him. Alberto's face darkened. See, what did I tell you? How many stories were made up about him? Not that it is shameful to be a peasant, but they mentioned it in such a derogatory manner, trying to prove that my brother was a simple-minded and ignorant fellow. On the contrary, he had an academic degree, spoke five languages, and was somewhat a poet. Our maternal grandfather was an engineer coming from France to design and construct the first Italian railways. He settled at Castellaneta, where father met mother. Father had been a veterinary. But when Mama knew him, he was a cavalry officer and a fine-looking man. Rudolfo inherited his passion for horses and learned to ride as a child and how he loved it. However, as he longed to travel around the world, he tried to join the Royal Naval Academy. He was not admitted because he lacked one centimeter of the required chest expansion. He was 13 and so disappointed he wanted to die. However, our uncle, who had taken father's place in our family when father died, convinced him to enroll in the Royal College of Scientific Agriculture, from which he graduated with all honors. With this diploma, he thought he could do well in America, a land rich in agriculture and also full of Italians. He finally persuaded mother to let him leave, and she lent him a thousand dollars, at that time a sizable sum, but this he spent in a short time down to the last penny in a short time. His diploma did not get him, after months of unemployment, hardship, and even hunger, anything but a meager job as an assistant gardener in a small city park. Even this did not last long, as he was still a wild kid he wanted to try the gardener's motorcycle and wrecked it. Naturally, he was fired. He then was hired by a ballroom, where many single women came without partners, and they all wished to dance with Rudolfo. They came purposely on his account because he was well-mannered, gallant, and well-dressed, the latter often at the expense of some meal skipping. And how did he get into the movies? First of all, a professional dancer saw him at the ballroom where he was working and engaged him as her partner. Later, she retired on marrying and Rudolfo was engaged as dancer by an operetta company in San Francisco. Now here was a chance to see California, a fine agricultural land par excellence. He was sure he could make use of his diploma there. 
However, when he arrived in San Francisco, the company found that the empresario had decamped with all the money and no one was paid. Poor Rudolfo was desperate when he encountered an old friend from New York, an actor, and this man got him into the movies as an extra. However, they gave him small bits as a gangster, a sinister type, etc., which he did not like at all, so much so that he decided to make plans to settle in some agricultural communities in Northern California and finally make use of his fine diploma. Suddenly he was offered a fantastic offer for a fantastic role. They were looking for a name artist but a Latin type for a leading role in The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and Gene Mathis, a screenwriter for MGM, succeeded in convincing the heads of the company that Rudolfo would be perfect for the part. And the role of Giorgio brought Rudolfo up to seventh heaven. He made a furor. Rudolfo instantly became one of the greatest stars of the day and soon one of all time. End quote there. I think the following is a typo, but I will read it as it is translated. And I quote, I did not make that statement. I know perhaps the greatest of all time. Judging by the way he is remembered, the affection the public still has for him. Didn't your brother have children? No, and it was a great sorrow in his life, says Alberto, because he loved children so much. He dreamed of having a big family, a big one, he said, with eight or ten children. But he was not fortunate with either of his two wives, so much so that he wished to adopt Johnny, Jean, legally. Naturally, our laws did not permit this, so he made him his sole heir. But I will tell you about this later. Valentino let a bitter smile across his face and raised his veiled eyes to the large picture of his brother. Poor Rudolfo, he sighed. What an injustice. Now, this page is uh, ended with the words, To be continued. Part 2. Interview with the brother of the celebrated actor Rudolfo Valentino, a myth which many try to copy. The accompanying picture is Valentino in Son of the Sheik. Alberto Valentino is seated in his little office, wrapped in his own thoughts. I awaken him. Why do you smile so bitterly when I mention the fact that your brother named your son Johnny as his sole heir? I ask him. Because when Rudolfo made his will, he was sure that he would someday leave millions. Instead, after waiting eight years after the death of poor Rudolfo, eight years of court proceedings, of bitterness, of disillusionment, Johnny had to pay taxes, the cost of the stamps for all the legal documents, all of which had to be signed. Certainly, it was not Rudolfo's fault. He left money, yes, but there were no millions. Then we have Falcon's Lair, the magnificent villa which Rudolfo had bought for his Natasha. At that time, he paid $148,000, and I don't know how much more he poured into it. We had to sell it at auction for $18,000 to pay the lawyers and legal expenses. How did that happen? On account of the sudden death of Rudolfo, his manager, George Gilman, which is George Ullman, uh, who is executor of the will and to whom Rudolfo had given power of attorney to manage all his affairs. He immediately profited by the situation and made a pile of investments, loans, etc., which turned sour. Of the money my brother left, we never saw one cent. We demanded an accounting of the investments, but all was in vain. We were betrayed by our own lawyers. After years of waiting at the liquidation, there was not one penny left for the boy. How much do you think Falcon's Lair is worth today? One million dollars, I have been told. It is a castle. There are 18 unfurnished rooms. Immense, some with fountains. One could get lost there. Rudolfo wanted to fill them with all the beautiful things he had acquired from all over the world for his Natasha. When did Rudolfo know of your son? When he left Italy, naturally, your son had not been born. No, of course not. I was not even married yet. Rudolfo returned to Italy when Johnny was nine years old. I was then municipal secretary of the city of Campobasso, and he was at the pinnacle of his fame. Certainly he had changed, only in appearance. He looked like a prince, but at heart he was the same exuberant big kid who had left Castellaneta ten years previously. Our reunion, as you can imagine, was most moving. My boy was crazy about his uncle and he for his nephew. Natasha Rambova, was she Russian? 
No, American, a stepdaughter of Richard Hudnut, a well-known chemist and creator of the Richard Hudnut Cosmetics, and a millionaire. She took the name of Natasha Rombova because she wished to become a ballerina and thought the new name might facilitate her career. However, when she saw that was not getting her anywhere, she began to design costumes and scenery in which field she was very good. She was with Nazimova during the filming of Camille that Rudolfo met her and fell madly in love. This was really the one great love of his life. But hadn't your brother been previously married to another? Yes, but it lasted only a month. Rudolfo had fallen in love with a young actress named Jean Ackman, Jean Acker, uh, and married her immediately, so taken was he. However, on the wedding night, Jean locked herself in the bedroom and nothing could induce her to open the door. Rudolfo thought he would go mad. This went on every night. She was a strange woman. I have certain phobias, she added. She would not go to bed with a man wanting to remain pure with her husband. Naturally, Rudolfo sued for divorce. But didn't he also divorce Natasha? It was Natasha who wanted the divorce. She was interfering too much in the production of Rudolfo's films. In principle, she was only in charge of the costumes and scenery, but she began to lay down the rules for everybody and everything and to influence contracts. She wished to be the sole authority on anything having to do with the films of her husband. Rudolfo let her have her own way because he was so madly in love with her. However, the producer, Joe Shank, wanted no part of such an arrangement. He offered Valentino a stupendous, irrefutable contract, making him co-producer, but with the proviso that Natasha be completely excluded from any participation. She would possibly be refused entrance to the studios. These facts made her furious, and she sued for divorce. For my brother, it was a sort of death before actually dying. But tell me, your true family name is Guglielmi. How did your brother come to change it to Valentino, but always... Why did he adopt this name? Well, Valentino, in a certain way, is also our family name, or more exactly, Valentina. It was an honorific title assigned to our family by one of the popes. When Rudolfo made The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the head of MGM insisted on a change of name. Guglielmi was too difficult to pronounce for Americans. Rudolfo chose the other name belonging to our family, altering it slightly to Valentino. When I came to America at Rudolfo's invitation to study the cinema situation and then open our Paris office, everyone called me Valentino, too. There was no point in insisting on Guglielmi. Too difficult, they would say. It was Rudolfo who insisted on using this other name to make things less complicated. So from that time, this cognomen has been legally ours. Your brother died two years before sound came in. What do you think would have happened to him with the talkies? There would have been nothing to fear. Rudolfo was gifted with a fine baritone voice, and his dream had been to become a great actor. I think he would have been, had he any relatives. Two cousins. But do you know how many people want to pass as his relatives? Last year in the periodical La Revista, there was an article concerning a young French actress who called herself Evelyn Valentino and claiming to be a relative of Rudolfo. According to her, she was the daughter of my son Johnny, whom she called Roberto, and who was, according to her, a musician living in Paris. I would have to be her grandfather, for she said she was the daughter of Rudolfo's nephew. I am his only brother. She further says that her child is the last direct descendant of Rudolfo. I wrote the periodical a few days ago demanding a retraction. Your brother died in New York. Did you decide to have the body removed to Hollywood? Yes, that was the place that made his fame. He belonged to Hollywood. I shall never forget that trip. In New York, the people appeared to have gone mad crowding the mortuary chapel where the body rested for five days. They wept, cried out loud. Thousands wanted to see him for the last time and stood in line in the rain. As the train moved westward at every little town, people could be seen kneeling as the train passed, women in mourning, children throwing flowers. At one station where the train stopped for a few minutes, an elderly, shabbily dressed man was brought in to me. He had a bouquet of wildflowers, which he handed me, saying, They are for him. I have nothing else to give him. At Chicago, where the casket had to be 
transferred to another train, the crowd broke the ropes set up by the police just to get a little closer to the body of their idol, the one they loved so and who had perhaps changed their lives with a touch of romance, relieving the monotony of their daily lives. Many were weeping. I wept too. End quote. In closing, Renato, I think this article establishes some important points uh, as to how certain misconceptions were brought forward into the Rudolph Valentino narrative. In 2003, when I discovered the court documents, this would change Alberto Guglielmi Valentino's narrative forever. At the end of this interesting interview, very, very revealing, I say, as the usual, Fiat Justitia, Ruat Celum. And for the good, good guys, Arrivederci! <laughs>